Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Championship Sports. By now, all of you have heard about the tragic and untimely death of Bruiser Brody. Very disappointing to all of us. He was a longtime friend. Uh, tonight's show, which you're going to see in its entirety from the Sportatorium, makes reference to Bruiser on a big card coming up Friday. Obviously, Bruiser will not be with us, but stay with us. Later on, we're going to update what will happen Friday and disregard the references to Bruiser as we pick up this tape from the Sportatorium in its entirety. Okay, we're going to jump back in here from the studios now and take a moment to talk about what has happened to Bruiser Brody and what is going to happen this Friday. First of all, let me thank you for staying up late with us tonight after the Ranger game. Remind you that you will see all of championship sports here in Channel 11 tonight, just as it was taped a week ago last night at the Sportatorium in Dallas. The awkward thing about all of this is, is that the show you're watching from a week ago last Friday was taped the night before Bruiser Brody died uh, tragically in Puerto Rico. Of course, we're making references to it tonight about a big main event that had been scheduled between Bruiser and Kamala. Uh, Skandor Akbar is making reference to it in his interview tonight. We're talking about it all night long. Obviously, with Bruiser now deceased, he will not be with us this coming Friday. Uh, Kerry Von Erich will step in uh, and take Bruiser's place in the main event Friday against Kamala the Ugandan Giant. The Von Erichs, of course, have been uh, touched by this just as all of us have. They were good friends of Bruiser's. Bruiser had been their tag team partner many times. You know, Bruiser was one of the most popular wrestlers to ever set foot in the ring uh, during the 70s and 80s uh, here in the uh, Texas and uh, Great Southwest area. He was world famous and will be sorely missed. In fact, we're going to dedicate Friday night's card to Bruiser Brody. Uh, many of you I know would like to have a picture of Bruiser to remember him by. Uh, and if you would like one, we'll be glad to give you one uh, Friday night free of charge. Those will be made available to you fans in memory of Bruiser. Uh, come join us and we'll dedicate the... Uh, night to him the card will be the same as you hear us promoting all evening long with the one exception and that is the main event between bruiser and kamala will now be Kerry von erig world heavyweight champion against kamala the ugandan giant okay we're going to continue now with excitement just as it happened the other night at the sportatorium here on championship sports ladies and gentlemen peoples of all types children of all ages humans and non-humans Let's get ready for Sports Conspirators! Welcome to Sports Conspirators! Volume 8, The Murder of Bruiser Brody. I'm Braden. I'm Andrew. Uh, we are the Sports Conspirators back at it uh, and with our brand new excellent uh, live stream uh, brought to you by uh, you. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we're back in the wrestling. We, you know, we did some baseball. Uh, we're going to stand by our comments. If anyone's talking shit, uh, judges on juice. We don't give oh, a fuck. A thousand percent. Right. Um, a thousand percent. As of this recording, he's now hit 62 home runs. Um it's only a matter of time before we find out he's juicing. I do. It, it literally, it's only a matter of time. Guys chewing on gummies. He's darting his butt. Like, listen, they've gotten better. They're smarter now. They know how to hide it. They're not hiring, hi, hiring fake doctors from fucking Miami, Boca Vista, yeah. whatever the fucking place was called, right? Like, yeah, body by Boca. Boca yeah, like the fucking budget's bigger now, boys. Yeah. Uh, like, you look at that guy. I'm telling you, he's he's juicing. And the reason I know he's juicing because. Right now, baseball has a pitching problem. Pitchers cheating. We're in the pine tar era. We're in the spider the tack. Spider tack. Modified balls. Dude, you can watch video after video of these pitchers throwing impossible to hit pitches, and the only reason they're throwing them is because they're 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 cheating, right? And amongst this huge, we're we're gonna talk about That's the issue. Judge is fucking ripping lines of Adderall, man. Yeah, like, right? He's dialed in. He's ready they're to go. Th they're throwing a hundred mile an hour curveballs that travel eight feet, but they're they're coming in for judge at 20 you know what i mean at 20 miles per hour he's just dinging these things um the reason i'm saying he's on juice is because like i said there's a pitching controversy right now with pitchers cheating and we're gonna have to touch on that eventually but there i will say though remember strike zone's getting smaller right parks are getting smaller they're getting more home run friendly they are making steps to make offense bigger yeah. they want the long ball back well, whatever. Fuck baseball. 
Uh, no, we love baseball. We just not a fan of cheating. Um, but th- we're it's back. either hey or let everybody cheat. Simple. And and we're back talking about a real sport today, and Absolutely. and that is uh, the world of dealer. professional uh, wrestling. Um, and you know today we're getting into a little bit of true crime as well because um, unfortunately uh, we're talking about the murder of Bruiser Brody. And probably if you're listening to this, uh, if you're not an avid wrestling fan or you, you know, you're just that's not necessarily man. true because I've, I I consider myself and you like we've been to WrestleMania. Yeah. Right. We are avid wrestling fans. And this looking into this case file absolutely opened my eyes to a character that I had no idea existed. I've seen pictures of him in the past, but I didn't know who Bruiser Brody was. I had no clue. Yeah. He definitely came up like rose to prominence in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. This guy. Bruiser Brody, real name Frank Donald Goodish. Goodish? Goodish. Okay. Goodish. Good. Goodish? Goodish. He's a Goodish. Uh, he, he was, if he was around today, he would be, um, you would, everyone would know his name because this guy was the prototype. Six foot eight, 300 pounds, and this guy moved like a little, little guy. But he, he moved like Rey Mysterio. Listen. Yeah, he, he shouldn't have been able to move like this. And it, like, it's great too. Cause you're watching these clips and like, I don't want to, you know what? Come on. I'm not going to bash. I'm not going to bash the good old days. Cause there was some great wrestling back then, but let's be honest. 90% of these guys had second jobs. They're long haul truck drivers. They're yeah. milkmen. You know, <laughs> they get all, they'd finish the show, go home, smoke a dart and start their night shift. Yeah. Right. Like these guys head to the ring, throw on the tights. Yeah. And they all got guts and you know, we haven't, we're not quite in the steroid era yet. And you have this fucking specimen, like let's, you know, Bruiser Brody, Frank Goodish, this guy played three, four years for the fucking Redskins. And yes, at the time they were the Redskins. Now the football team or the yeah. command, the Manders, whatever you want to call them. But like he is an, you can, he's an, an elite level athlete, and, right? Like, and you can see in the ring, he's doing stuff that just would be fucking mind blowing at a man that size. Well, and to the, the other thing about him that really struck me learning about him and watching his matches and stuff is like this guy wasn't just a meathead. He's not. He wasn't a meat dummy. Like he just didn't just show up and he's just Muscle like, dummy. who am I? Who am I? Who am I punching? Right. Like he actually, you know, a lot of people credit him for his business sense of how smart and savvy he was. Um, you know, and and it, to be honest, it was sometimes at his downfall because he was so smart with how he booked himself and how he controlled his bookings. Uh, that it would upset promoters because they're just like, listen, I'm, I fucking want to pay you to do this and do this. And he's like, well, no, that the story doesn't make sense. This is yeah. going to work for my character long-term. This is going to hurt me now. And I won't be able to recover from this. So if we're going to do th- stuff, whether I put over someone else or I'm being put over, it has to work for me. So when I book myself in the future, I can continue my run. Uh, and how, like he was always thinking way ahead. Well, like he, when he was in Japan, he got the nickname, the intelligent monster. And it wasn't just because of how he acted in the ring. It was the way he acted outside of the ring too. And a big thing with wrestling in this era, right? Like it wasn't like wrestling is today. Like if you're a WWE superstar, you're not switching franchises, right? Like you're not jumping from AEW to new Japan, right? Like that's really rare. That's why when we've had this like mass exodus in the last couple of years of athletes from WWE to all the other supporting, you know, uh, companies it's you know it's been shocking because usually like growing up if you started in the attitude era you're going to retire and you know with the wwe like that that was normal but back then it was totally normal for you to jump from promotion to promotion well it was right? the territories right there yeah. was every there was whereas you know for the long time in in our age group there was you know we had the small one run of wcw when we were kids growing up right the monday night wars but for the most part of our lives, there's been one outfit that we've known of, and that's WWF, WWE. Well, and why it's important, like why I'm mentioning it is because like you have no allegiance to these organizations. So if you yeah. show up and they fucking make you job to some random guy and you go to the same fans are going to the, if it's in the same territory, the same fans are going to the next show and they're going to know that you job to fucking Bob Backlund there last week. Yeah. And you know, like it's, it, nobody's going to really buy into that. You're selling your own t-shirts. You're selling your own merch, right? You are selling you. Well, and and I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually a thing that I've has always surprised me about wrestling is that wrestlers, even today, 
in WWE and stuff are treated like independent contractors. Now, now they sign these exclusive deals with WWE. They get paid a lot of money, but they are still basically independent contractors. They're their own business. You know, they're not getting the benefits of like, you know, working for a company of like health and dental and stuff like that. I'm sure WWE does something for them. It might be a monetary sum, whatever. I don't know the ins and outs of their contracts. But back in this in the 70s, like you said, you were an independent contractor, right? You were going in as you were if if I was going in, if Bruiser Brody, it's like it's you know, you're dealing with Bruder Brosy Inc. and he's the CEO and it's his business is is his persona. So it's like your whole livelihood rests on your reputation. And Bruiser Brody in the ring had an insane one. This guy was a fucking menace in the ring. Um, some of oh, his dude, highlights. He, so, like, he was infamous for being volatile. Didn't matter if fans were in the way, opponents. He Like, this man is coming to the ring swinging a chain. And fans are running like fucking Godzilla. They're they're hitting because the, they know he's they're, he's going to walk through you. He doesn't give a shit. Yeah, he he literally didn't. There's clips of him going through the crowd, just swinging a chain wildly in the crowd. And people are just panicking, like sprinting out of the way, trying to get the fuck out of the way, not get hit. And he didn't give a fuck. And that was his thing. And the interesting thing is, is we don't actually know a lot about Frank Goodish, the person. We don't. And that's because in this area, it's like the second he would walk out that door, anyone who saw him, they saw Bruiser Brody, and he acted that part. Well, th this is back in the days of, like, kayfabe is king, right? Like, we know, like, no, no, we're, these wrestling fans, they know that wrestling is real. This is real. Yep. Bruiser and Brody is an actual fucking maniac swinging a chain, and he wants to murder whoever he's fighting in the ring. And if you don't know what kayfabe is, that's the, the practice of, like, you are in character. All times. It's, it's almost like method acting, right? It's you are when you you are that character. You embody that character. No one outside of your close circle sees you as anything other than that character, right? And so you, you, when you're out in public, it's like when you're interacting with fans, if, if you're a heel, if you're a bad guy, you treat them like shit because yeah, you're you a bad guy to boo, yeah. right? Absolutely. And like, so it's interesting. Like we've talked about it. Bruce, Bruiser Brody, also quite an intelligent man, knew that he had to invest in himself. He knew he had to sell his product. So one thing that he was infamous for amongst, you know, you know, the locker rooms is it was always going to be a rough match with him. He was violent. He would toss you around. He would take liberties. And a lot of times, like they, they say, like, you know, a lot of times the match might not, the decision might go his, not go his way, but he's going to make you earn it, right? He's yeah. not going to be a slouch. He's not going to put you over right? Unless you earn it. And if you don't earn it, he would refuse to put you over. Even if that's what the promoters were paying him to do, he would not put you over. Well, I think part of his thing is that he always wanted win or lose. He needed to appear strong, even in defeat, right? Because it's like he, he was, he was not someone that would not put someone over, but he needed to put people over in the way that at the end of the match, they went, fuck, that was lucky. He got that. Bruiser Brody's still a, like he's he's not a slouch like you said like even in defeat you he made you work for it so it, I, it, I will say though there are some accounts that maybe he did actually in fact refuse to put people over and I, I've got a really good example of it and it's amazing because you can actually watch you can watch this match if you're curious hop on YouTube and and search the 1987 steel cage match Bruiser Brody versus Lex Luthor and this is he's Lex Luger's brand new at this point, okay? Brand new green wrestler. And Brody being the hardened vet he was, a lot of times these wrestlers, like they'll approach each other. They haven't had a lot of time in the ring together, right? Practice. So they, they approaches him in the ring and Lex is like, hey man, like listen, like how do you want to do this match? You know, should I do this? You do this. And then, you know, at the end, you know, I'll win. And and Brody looked at him and said, no, 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 listen kid, like that's that's cute and everything, but that's not how we do it. We call it, we're going to call it in the ring. All right, you follow my lead, we'll call it in the ring. And Lex, not really understanding how things work, kind of was well, set and, in his ways and was like, and, no, and I, honest, I don't want to call it in the ring. He was never one to be really known for being able to call things in the ring. He had a limited move set his whole career. Uh, he he just looked, the, he was one of those guys that looked the part. Absolutely looked the part. And he basically starts telling Brody like, hey, listen, this is the way it's going to go. All right, I'm the face. I'm the, I'm the new big guy in town. I'm the alpha. This is what we're going to do. 
So what happened? What ends up following ha- happened? You know, match starts. They're both in the steel cage, and Brody refu- like Brody's eating shots and not even reacting at all. Just stands there. Yeah. <laughs> Lex just starts pounding on him, and he just stands there and takes it. Doesn't make th- no reaction, no nothing. No. And cells. then all of a sudden, Lex just like stops and like looks at him, looks at the look in Bru- Bruiser Brody's face, and climbs out of the fucking cage. <laughs> like just out. I'm out. Like I yeah. want nothing to do with this guy. This guy's nuts. He's gonna murder me. Absolutely. Probably probably the right fucking decision to make. So there is a little bit of a, you know, a few different examples of this and showing that, okay, so Bruiser Brody might not be the most easy to work with on all accounts. From what I understand, like a lot of, a lot of wrestlers who did, you know, come up with them, the guys like, you know, uh, Abdullah, the butcher had nothing but good things to say. Like that he was hard. He was mean. You're going to get hurt. But if there was respect, Brody would treat you well. Mm -hmm. Right. But there have been some times where, like, there's some quotes, and this is one of my favorite ones. That this this is from Bruiser Brody, Frank Goodish. Um, he was quoted saying, "The truth is that all wrestlers are sheep. Wrestlers don't have the guts. They're all at the end of the cliff and will jump off as soon as the promoter tells them. They'll stand up and make a lot of noise beforehand. Then, when the promoter says come in, they all say yes, sir, yes, sir. I'll do that. So he goes ahead and says, like, these promoters." Right, they they don't always have the best interest in you, and you have to stand up to them. But most wrestlers won't. And, won't. But he will. And and again, this is like wrestling has always been a brotherhood. It has these guys are family. But at the end of the day, especially in the seventies and eighties, you were a brotherhood, but you were also in business for yourself. Like, right. So it's it, it was this balance of like, yes, these are the guys you work with. You you knew the crews you would normally wrestle. You had your guys you like to work with. But at the end of the day, like. You know, like if you get bad booking, that just hurts you, no one else. Yeah. And at this point in time, so like Bruiser Brody, he's kind of like, like Braden mentioned earlier, there's no big, like the, the WWF is not the WWF yet. All right. There's a bunch of these small organizations. What's the word? Sorry. What did you call them again? Territories. They're territories. That's right. So there you get a bunch of small different territories and Brody's kind of ro- rising to the top of these territories. He's a fucking... He's a huge sell, right? You get this big man that's violent, you know, super athletic, lots of fun, super unpredictable, puts the, you know, he scares kids, everybody likes him. And at this point, he starts getting a little bit of attention by, from Vince Sr., which is, he's, at this point in time, he's running the WWF. Okay, yeah, yes, you heard that right, Triple WF. And one of the things I'll just say too is, uh, before we get into that, is that at this point in time, when he's starting to deal with Vince Sr., Bruiser Brody is probably a worldwide star before there's worldwide stars. He's known in Japan. He's known in all the territories. Like he, lots of people know the name. Lots of people know him. So he, he is a draw. He's a draw, right? You got to remember, like you've got. I, I'd have to look up the figures, but like you've got, like at this point in time, the the big wrestling shows are rivaling other professional sports. Yeah, for viewership, this... if not like beating them, right? Like wrestling is one of the major sports right now. You're watching. NBA, MLB, NFL, and wrestling, right? Like this isn't the joke that, you know, unfortunately is for a lot of people nowadays. Yeah. Right. So a lot of people eat, breathe, and sleep this, especially back then. And so you've got this big star. Of course, Vince Sr. wants him in his organization, right? So he comes, he does a lot of, it sounds like, I don't know if he ever actually won the championship, but he competed for it quite a bit. Um, He had a big push. And ended up losing, I believe it was Bruno San Martino, right? Yeah. Yeah. So he ended up kind of, he did. Who is, let, let, let's just say Bruno San Martino. He was the guy. He holds the record for the longest heavyweight championship reign of all time. It will never be broken. It's like he was the like Hulk two, Hogan. Over 2,000 days. Like, it's insane. He held it for years and years. Like, yeah. wow. He was the Hulk Hogan before Hulk Hogan. He was yeah. the Stone Cold before Stone Cold, he was right? Like it's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So at this point in time, they brought Brody in. He's a big star, big heel kind of used to put over Sam uh, Bruno San Martino a little bit. And Brody kind of felt, you know what I mean? His, his run, his push was kind of starting to fizzle a little bit, mm-hmm. which started with some serious friction with Vince senior. Right. Yeah. And then <laughs> he kind of has an interaction with a new, um, what do you want? Like, I'd say at this point in time, Puerto Rican star that we, like he was big in Puerto Rico. Right. Well, and, and everyone, honestly, the Puerto Rican market in this era was 
fucking huge. Like everything that I've read and looked into, the Puerto Rican wrestling scene rivaled was a rival to New Japan, yeah. uh, the Southern states, everywhere. There it was it was as big of a draw as any as it was anywhere in this time. So everyone wanted to get their hands on like kind of get into that market and so one of the ways to get into that market was to bring puerto rican stars into your territory and have them compete and that's exactly what vince senior was doing right he, he was bringing a big up-and-comer puerto rican star right at the time he was dubbed the puerto rican dream and if you don't know who we're talking about we're talking about jose gonzalez and when he made his U.S. debut, he made he kind of debuted under the name in The Invader or The yeah. Invader One, Invader which, I don't know, man. Yeah, <laughs> Come terrible. on, boys. Yeah. You could try it a little harder than that. Yeah, he's they're like, you know, like no one in the States helped him out. They're like, Invader One? Yeah, like yeah. I don't, I wonder, because he did, he came in initially with the mask. I'm wondering if maybe eventually he would like take the mask off and be like, oh shit, it's the Puerto Rican dream, Jose Gonzalez, right? Yeah. Like, Kind of like Blue Blazer style. Yeah, maybe. It, it The one thing that, you know, struck me was that at this time, Jose Gonzalez, you know, maybe was a little too big for his bridges, right? Like he is... Uh, bridges or britches? Britches. Is it bridges? Yeah. Too I big for the bridges. bridges as well. Yeah, I like that too, though. That's good. <laughs> right? he's, That's he's good. Just, Rickyism. His, yeah, it's all head, water on the fridge anyways, buddy. Yeah, his it's head's so big, he's way too big for the bridges. Yeah. Uh, right? And he he's kind of being a little arrogant. He's pretty pretty green to be especially in these territories to be calling the shots and he made the mistake of basically talking shit to bruiser bruiser brody telling him how it's gonna be right much like we saw lex luger do uh he's like yeah you know what this is how it's gonna go i'm gonna win and he was kind of vince's boy vince was vince senior was kind of pushing this kid well he's like they brought me in i'm the fucking i'm the new show bud they brought yeah. me in i'm the i'm Puerto Rico's biggest fucking export right now. Yeah. Okay, I'm the guy. And so legend says, legend, wrestling legend says that uh, they were supposed to headline a match together. And Bruiser Brody was told to put over the invader. And Bruiser Brody said, was basically like, no. Nope. Fuck, this kid's a, he's a douchebag. It's going to hurt my character. No one here knows him. This guy's half the size of me. Nobody right. knows who he is. His name's Invader One. You didn't even give him a real fucking name. You want me to put this kid over? Uh, and then, you know, Jose, by all accounts, Jose Gonzalez is being quite arrogant towards Bruiser Brody. So when it gets to the match, Bruiser Brody just absolutely beats the shit out of Jose Gonzalez. And we're not talking like wrestling. Like we're talking, he beat the fuck out no, of no, him. No, he just, he, he just literally beat the shit out of this kid at the time. Just beat the fuck out of him. I was Tony Atlas said that the guy that Jose Gonzalez's head was the size of a pumpkin after after you he hit him with like the chained fist, like not pulling punches beat. They, they had to like help him out of the arena afterwards because he was beaten to a pulp. And oddly enough, one of these wrestlers that ended up helping him out was SG SD Jones, special delivery Jones. Great yeah. name. Right. Like, come on. Who's the, why you gotta be the invader when you got special delivery of Jones? Yeah. Come on, unreal. So SD Jones claims that after the match, while he's helping Gonzalez, Gonzalez said like directly, one day I'm going to kill that man. Yeah, he's fucking choked. I, I, I would be too. Yeah. Well, like, you, you know. Well, you just, like like we were just talking about, your, your reputation is everything. And yeah. you just got fucking squashed by yeah. somebody on all accounts whose fucking run is kind of coming to an end. He beat the fuck out of you. There goes your big American push. Yeah. Well, cause now it's like, well, you were, and you were supposed to go over and, yeah, and you, not, you, and you didn't. Yeah. And not by your choice. Like it was, so again, your reputation in the States is fucking your, your push that was supposed to be a run for this kid done dead in the water. And you, you got, like, and you got beat to a pulp. The, the crazy thing too is like, I feel bad for this fuck. So okay, Jose Gonzalez, like he's like my height. He's like five, yeah. eight, right? Big dude though. He's like yeah. 200 pounds, yeah. whatever. Still you're in the ring with an NFL D lineman. <laughs> Who's six, Guy's eight, six, eight, 300 pounds. And he just beats the fuck out of you. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do, man? Yeah. Nothing. And that's exactly what happened. He did nothing. He got ah, beat up. It's a fucking chihuahua versus a pit bull, man. No, thanks. Like that's, ah, so obviously, obviously Vince senior didn't really enjoy that. No, he's wasn't like, a fan. Not, he's like, listen, 
one, you beat this kid to a pulp. Two, you you totally you went in you went into business for yourself in the ring, which is never okay. It's good to be in business for yourself when you're leading, but when you make a deal and the promoter it makes squashed the call, it. and 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 that's what you're expected to do, right? It's so. Set. And he didn't. He went into business for himself out there. And Vince is like, you're done. I'm, we're not working together anymore. So obviously he kind of wore out his welcome in the WWF, right? Yeah. This is when his stint with New Japan starts kind of taking off, right? So he, ad- he adopts that moniker of the intelligent monster. He quickly becomes this fucking huge celebrity in Japan, waving his steel chain in the air. Like that's when he started doing it, waving his steel chain and coming out to like the immigrant strong by Led Zeppelin. Like fucking awesome. Like, what an awesome gimmick, right? Literally, when he comes out, Japanese fans get the fuck out of his way. They run away. They're terrified of this guy. So he brings that energy. He brings that kayfabe. He's Bruce Brody everywhere he goes in Japan. He's in the, you know, he's on magazine covers. He ends up getting pitted against um, Jap- Japan at the at the time's biggest star, uh, Antonio, uh, Inoki rest yeah. in peace. I think yeah. he just he, passed away. He, he like just passed like, away. a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, so rest in peace. Inoki. Fucking, another legend that if, Huge you legend. Up, if you look up highlights of him, there's Bad highlights ass. of him going off script because people are, he, people are being a little too rough with him in the ring and he, he beat the just beats the shit out of him. Well, he was a martial artist too, yeah. man. Like he was a badass. So him and Bru- Bruiser Brody would beat the fuck out of each other in these matches. People loved it. And we're talking like the, at this point in time, Bruiser Brody is so popular. This is 1985. 1985. It's rumored that he's making 14000 a week. Yeah. In 1985. Hu- just huge money. Huge fucking money. Right? So his star is just climbing right now in Japan. He's making great money. He's a fucking, he's, he's one of the biggest guys in the show. But like we said, like you work for different, different, agencies right you're bouncing you're bouncing from territory to territory now he's in japan unfortunately one of the places he ends up going to as well is the world wrestling council which is in puerto rico right and this is where he starts his big fuels with abdul the butcher and you know by all accounts these puerto rican fans want blood they want violence and brody and abdullah absolutely fucking deliver yeah the the fans are by all accounts in this time and and the fans in Puerto Rico are fucking insane. Like insane out for blood. Right. Well, and and they're completely buying into this kayfabe, right? Yeah. hundred percent. And so at this time he's, he's feuding with the the big faces and Abdullah. He's, he's feuding with Carlos Colon, which is an infamous name in wrestling. He's part of the, you know, he's in the WWE hall of fame. His sons are wrestlers. So he's feuding with the face of Cuba and at this time, Jose uh, Gonzalez is part of this organization. He's still wrestling, but he's more so known for his promoting, right? He's kind of more so doing things behind the scenes. And there's a lot of it, like there's heat and there, there's a uh, Buck Robley. Have you ever heard of Buck Robley? No, I, I Old school wrestler. He was quoted saying that, you know, Gonzalez and Frank would have interactions behind scenes. And this is one that he kind of quoted was, Frank would scream at Jose when he tried to give him a finish in the dressing room and the midget would go, would be so scared. He wouldn't do anything. Then all of a sudden Frank would say, it's okay. Don't worry about it. But then he got in the ring and Frank would double cross Jose and get whatever finish he wanted. Yeah. So he's, con- he's continuing this. He's already, he's kind of basically said to Jose, he's like, you're a bitch. I know you're a bitch. I beat you up. Yeah. You can say what you want as a promoter. Tell me what you want to do. I don't care. And then kind of pretends to go along with it and then does whatever the fuck he wants to do. In the room. And you know what, to be honest in this, I have everything we're going to talk about from now, like in Puerto Rico, there's not a lot of, this is fact. A lot of it is this guy said this, I heard this from this guy. So there's going to be varying accounts. And one of the accounts that I heard is that because of the heat between Jose Gonzalez and Bruiser Brody, Jose Gonzalez would a lot of times try to book Brody in bad spots and he's just going fuck you I'm not doing that like you little spineless piece of shit like what well, yeah like if Jack Briscoe he's another quote Frank would belittle Gonzalez in front of the boys he probably pushed it over the line Puerto Rico is such a little place right like he so he's bull, he's openly bullying Gonzalez in these locker rooms and so 
this is where we kind of fast forward to the untimely death of Bruiser Brody. So on July 16th, 1988, Brody was in the locker room before his scheduled match with Dan Spivey. This was at, oh God, Ramon Lobriel Stadium. I'm yeah, sure where's I Dan? Where's that. Dan when we need him? Eh? We should just get Dan to just read some of those things that we can play. On a Anyways, <laughs> it 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 basically a, a city near San Juan, Puerto Rico. Yeah. Okay. So when so he's getting ready for his match. Everybody's in the locker room. Tony Atlas is there. Uh, Dutch Mantel's there. A few names that are going to come up a little bit later. When Jose Gonzalez walks into the into the locker room with his towel in his hand, right? And he allegedly reaches out to Bruiser Brody and says, hey, would you come into the shower area with me? I'd like to discuss some business with you. And that's not, like, it wasn't uncommon in this time that, like, guys would step out to talk about finishes and whatever yeah. in private uh, just to hash things out. So, like, this is nothing out of the ordinary for these guys that are there. So, while they step into this room, you know, the people report an argument kind of ensued. They can hear the yelling, a little bit of back and forth, possibly a scuffle, but due to the dressing room, you know, the way it was designed, there was no witnesses to the actual altercation. You couldn't really see, right? And then one of the names that we mentioned, Tony Atlas, who was another American wrestler in Puerto Rico at the time, heard two loud screams, all right? Tony got up, ran into the shower, and saw Brody bent over holding his stomach. Atlas then looked up and noticed that Gonzalez was holding a knife. Okay, so nobody actually saw Gonzalez stab Brody. All they know is that they heard a couple loud screams, followed by Atlas running in and seeing, you know, Bruiser Brody standing there disemboweled or a bit like just holding his bowels in his hands, right? Yeah. So, like, I don't want to, I'm not going to get into the, the facts after, but I think it's really important that we discuss, like, the fact that. Gonzalez was witnessed walking into the into this fucking train, change room With holding the, a towel in his hand. Yeah, and we, that looked like something was wrapped in it. Yes, and knowing one of the things we we know, like we don't know, is what kind of knife. Uh, the knife has never been found. Was never um, was found. So we don't know if it was a pocket knife, uh, a fixed blade, but. By the accounts of the people there, it looked, it had to be a large blade. It had it had to be it a large to be blade, a large. Um, and it would have been concealed uh, prior to the shower. Um, Tony Alice did say that, like when he went in there, um, you know, Jose Gonzalez and Vader left, took off, and Bruiser Brody said, "They got me, brother." Yeah, they got me. Don't they let me go. Me. Right. Um, yeah, you see, and the problem I have, like. I, Atlas gives a very detailed story, especially in the dark side of the ring. He's like, oh, yeah. And then he swiped again with the knife and the, his ponytail come off. And it, his story to me seems it kind of jumps over, all over the place. Well, and, and not to mention there's conflicting stories about well, Manny Fernandez's story, right? Yeah. I, yeah. So I like I have that, too. In tw 2014, former pro wrestler Manny Fernandez gave somewhat of a different story. He stated that he was told that Brody was actually owed forty thousand dollars and demanded the money back. Brody was told he would receive the money at this event. Instead, his stomach was sliced open, causing Brody to fall to his knees. Then Gonzalez he held Brody's hair and stabbed him in the chest. Contrary to Atlas's stories, Fernandez was told that Atlas sat there and did nothing throughout the altercation. And yeah, it, and according to Manny, that it was in view of Atlas. But yeah. Atlas, Atlas and Dutch Mantel's stories do kind of line up. Yeah line up quite but but it's tough to say if that's basically like evolved with time because they've both been telling the same story for so long and well and one of the things is if you read between the lines like even stuff that dutch and tony say kind of line up with stuff that manny says about being owed the forty thousand dollars so what what i want to get into really quick is like why would this guy be owed forty thousand dollars right so one of the things that you, if you look into that you hear briefly talked about and it's hard to lock down um if it's factual what's rumor it's hearsay but you know we'll just paint the picture and you you can make a decision yourself one of the owners of the wwc was a, a shareholder was gorilla monsoon uh gorilla monsoon passed away in 1999 
um, legendary announcer. Honestly, Hall of Famer. When when people think announcers, you know, probably people think Jr. Michael Cole, whatever. Uh, Jerry Lawler. Um, for me, the best announcing pair was always Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse the Body Ventura. Absolutely. Like fucking. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so well, that's why we we were kids, right? That's kind yeah. of like that's. Yeah. So some people have said and you can see stuff that perhaps uh gorilla monsoon wanted out of the territory he wanted out of puerto rico and he sold his shares uh to bruiser brody and it, some of the people think that gorilla monsoon was perhaps owed a large sum of money and he was getting frustrated because he couldn't collect and they weren't paying him so almost in a little bit of a fuck you because he know he knew that there was heat between Carlos uh, Calron, uh, Jose Gonzalez and stuff. He sold his shares, not for money, but for the debt to Bruiser Brody. He's like, they owe me forty grand. You collect the forty grand, give me whatever twenty or X amount, and those shares are yours. So he's basically giving a fuck you to WWC by giving a part ownership to. Uh, Bruiser Brody, who already has heat with these people running it, right? He he has issues with them. Uh, he's beating them up. He's been difficult to work with. Uh, and he, you know, some people say he's on record being like, yeah, brother, I'm going down there. I'm changing things and I'm going to get my money and I'm no going to beat what? No matter no what, matter I'm going to beat it out of every single one of these motherfuckers if I have to. Absolutely. Right? So you start to think, okay, well, like, it, it starts to add up that like, okay, well, maybe – you you start to see this pattern of like okay well they've sold it to this guy they don't like that might be a motive for a reason to tr try to kill him. well absolutely too because and you think about it like more than the heat between jose gonzalez and bruiser brody you know as a motive it's like okay listen i already don't like this guy he's coming down here we have issue with him now we're gonna have to pay him out all this money right yeah who do you think the first guy to volunteer to get rid of this guy would be Oh, Jose Gonzalez. Jose Gonzalez. Fuck this guy. I would love to. Absolutely. Plus, at this, let's say, let, let's say at this point of time, Puerto Rico. You know, if, if you're not getting busted with the knife in your hand by the police, you're probably going to get away. Not only that, you're going to go ahead and tell me that their biggest wrestling organization didn't have some high-ranking official friends that and, could have maybe pulled some strings for them because we're going to get into that too again it's it's a it's a money maker right if this isn't the days of they're not they're, the this event was not in a church basement this was in a baseball stadium this thing oh, yeah. was packed, sold out right like th there this is a money maker so it's it's there is a lot of money flowing to this organization this isn't something where it's like oh like oh you know we're going to make $1000 off the show no like they these this was big money events so now we have this kind of the, the this kind of painting of like perhaps he was going to be a shareholder um you know now or perhaps he just or perhaps the just the he the previous friction the heat between gonzalez yeah and brody was enough too right he was quoted saying i'm gonna kill that man one day yeah and so now if you look at if you listen to tony atlas's story about the like before the event it, it kind of adds some and and sorry and and dutch it, it adds some further background for me anyways and that's that before they were going to head down to the arena that day on june 18th or uh, july 17th 1988 um when they got down to the lobby they saw bruiser brody just hanging around right and they said to him they're like hey what are you doing and he said i'm waiting for i'm supposed to get picked up by jose gonzalez and they said oh was he here yet and he goes i don't know i'm just waiting for him and they said well we're leaving right now why don't you come with us brother like all no big deal and he said, ah, oh, fuck it, sure. So he jumped in a car with them. So the person who later, uh, hours later, you know, stabs Bruiser Brody to death was supposed to come and pick him up. I find that very suspicious. Well, you think about it. Like, do you think he would, do you think out of all the, like, this is premeditated. We yep. Come on, let's be honest. He walked in there with the weapon. They had planned it out. Do you think it was in his plans to stab him in a fucking locker room full of how many different people? No, no way. Uh, of course that was a backup plan. But at that point, they're like, we got no other fucking options. Now, I – and I, so as the other thing that um, um, Dutch points out, Zeb Coulter, if, uh, you know, from recent times, we the people, um, he he pointed out that when they got to the arena, he said he he's like, when I got there, he's like, you could just 
feel attention. He said it, it made me uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable. And he said one thing that he thought was interesting is when he got there, he saw Carlos Colon, um, Jose Gonzalez, and I can't remember who else. They were like huddled together, like kind of like arguing, right? And he couldn't, and he was like, he saw that. I'm going to stab him. No, I want to stab him. And he <laughs> left five minutes later. And then within that five minutes of seeing them arguing, coming back to the room, Jose Gonzalez had gone in and stabbed um, Bruiser, Bruiser Brody. That's wild. Now, and, and then, you know, get like, let's be, okay, so he was stabbed, eviscerated. You know, he some of his bowels were protruding. Not necessarily a death blow, okay? The death blow came later due to the fact that the ambulance took over an hour to get to the stadium. Again, the, the traffic was so bad. This is a sold-out event. They just couldn't get anyone there. And yeah, and when they, they did, yeah. they were, they had like a, you know, like there are tons of female paramedics. They're very confident. I know from personal, you know, experience. But they send, a, you know, a small woman and an elderly man, and they both try to load Bruiser Brody up on the cot, and they can't. He's 6'8", He's two, 300 pounds. That's a big dude, man. So Tony Atlas actually had to help carry Bruiser Brody. He was a Mr. Stretcher. Olympia, wasn't he? Like he, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Like, Let's say he's Jack. Like he's huge. Yeah, yeah. Tony Atlas yeah. is huge, too. Um, so the ambulance is like, does anyone want to ride with him? And like, no one, no one in the locker room. Everyone's like talking about their finish and shit. Like, no one cares. And Tony Atlas is like, well, I, I'm, I will. Like, I'm going to go. So they go to the hospital together. And Tony Atlas, like, he, he tells a story. Of he goes there and, like, the hospital there is, like, doesn't really care that he's laying there. And he's like, you know, my friend's been stabbed. He's like, yeah, okay, welcome to the club. Everyone here is stabbed. Like, well, he's like, he's like a, a, a stab wound in the U.S. is like a fucking cold here. Yeah. Right? Like, just, sorry, bud. Like, get yeah, in line. Like, grab a number. Take a number. So he, like, the story goes is that he actually physically went and <laughs> assaulted the doctor, picked him up, and... That's what I, 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 like, these stories, it, 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 Tony Atlas' story is so grandiose. Everything's yeah. just, you know, he's this big, massive hero, and he saved the day, and, like, it's just, I don't know. I don't want to disparage the guy, because I have no idea, but it just seems, like, you know when you can kind of just tell that things are being well, exaggerated, I, my and... My thing is, I'm like, if you go in there, and you kick open some doors and you grab a doctor security or police are escorting you out of the hospital. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, so he brings them there. They're like, okay, yeah, we'll get your friend right in. Um, and they're like, yeah, we'll get him right in. Please don't hurt us. And then they're like, please leave. And he's like, okay, he's like your friend's stable now, please leave. And, uh, so he heads back to the arena. And when he gets there, he says like, everyone, no one gives a fuck. Yeah, everyone's getting ready, lacing their boots. Show must go on. Jose's no back. About him. Jose's back at the stadium getting ready for a match. And there's some police there. And he, Tony Atlas is like, they're like, yeah, you know, the fans here are crazy. And he's like, what do you mean the fans are crazy? He goes, yeah, well, we don't know how we're going to find the fan that came in and stabbed Bruiser Brody. And he's like, a fan? He's like, is that what everyone's telling you? He's like, it was that guy over there. It was, yeah, it was right there. G Jose Gonzalez. It was that man. Like, what do you, what yeah. do you mean? It wasn't a fan. Yeah. And so the police are kind of like, oh, they're taken aback by that. And now the one thing that Tony Atlas says is, um, he says later that night, cause he points the finger. He's the person that points the finger at Jose Gonzalez and basically gets him arrested and charged with this first degree murder. Um, he gets a call that night from a Puerto Rican wrestler that goes and get the say, fuck out of here. Yeah. They say, Hey man, like with everything going on, get the fuck out of Puerto Rico right yeah, now. Get out of town now, get on a plane and get, get home. So he, he, that same afternoon, he finds out Bruder Brody, Brody passes away in the hospital and he, he flies immediately home. He's like, fuck this. I'm out of here. And he gets a call the next day from Carlos going on being like, Hey man, where are you? We want to pick you up. What's going on. We want to talk to you about what's, what's happening. Where are you at? And, Tony has like, I'm at home in the States. He goes, why'd you leave? Why'd you leave for this? Why'd you leave the States? Like, so, and honestly, to me, I think the plan was, I think the plan was always, they were going, the original plan was they were going to pick up Bruiser Brody. They were going to murder him. Jose Gonzalez was going to say a fan came, stabbed him. And, and then they were going to continue on, right? Oh, a crazy fan st stabbed him to death. And that got fucked up by, um, 
Dutch and Tony Atlas taking Bruiser Brody to the arena. And then they're mm-hmm. like, fuck it. Let's just go ahead with it. It's fine. 100%. We got enough money. We'll just say a fan came in. No one saw it. Right? And and when Tony Atlas pointed the finger, they went, all right, well, fuck. He's next. We're going to kill him. We have to. Right? Cause, and the motive, Anybody else they, we should kill for good measure, just in case? The motive's there, right? It's Now you don't have to pay this guy. Right now, you keep the money. You get those shares. You don't have to worry about him running things. Right, Jose Gonzalez gets his revenge that he always wanted. It, you know, it, it ties it up. The, they were going to get away with this no matter what because yes. it, this does go to court, right? This does go to court, and Gonzalez pleads self defense, right? And this is back in the day where wrestling is real, and you have this six foot eight fucking monster of a man that walks around with a chain, and you got homegrown five foot eight fucking Puerto Rican Jose Gonzalez. Who are they going to side with? Well, and again, it's it's kind of hard to find the records of the trial. But from what I've read, the biggest issue that the prosecution had was that no witnesses showed up. That's because they sent them fucking subpoenas a week late. Yes. Dutch Mantel and Tony Atlas both got their fucking subpoenas a week late. Right. And like, that's insane. This was corrupt from the top bottom. Oh, 100, from the top 100%. To the bottom. 100%. I think people were getting paid off to just make this process not work. And defense on this case uh, for for Jose Gonzalez um, basically did a motion for no evidence, like a no evidence fine. There's no evidence that he did this because there's no one here saying you just have a prosecution being like, yeah, he did this. But no witnesses, no knife, nothing was ever found. So they acquit him. Jose Gonzalez is acquitted. And by all means, he goes on for what, another 30 years? To have a wrestling career? Oh, yeah. He's used. The pr- promotions use him. And, d- dude, one thing that I f- found out that kind of sickened me about this is that uh, Carlos Cal- Calrón? Colón. Colón? Yeah. In Puerto Rico, not too long ago, used this as an angle against Invader. He said, oh, I'm now at the twenty five a 25th anniversary of Bruiser Brody being killed. He said... Oh, they use it as an angle. He said, oh, you know, I'm going to, I've got Invader in the ring and I'm going to punish him for what he did 25 years ago. Right. It's and, so fucked up, man. Yeah. And, and, and listen, we, you know, wrestling's always, you know, there's been, but that's a, that man legit murdered Bruiser Brody. Yeah, this is an attitude error. This is the homicide error, boys. Like this yeah. is, this is fucked up. Yeah. It's and, not okay. And, and stabbed him to death. And, and seemingly no one cared and everyone swept it around under the rug. And this isn't the first time in professional wrestling that, you know, pe- I would say this is the most evidence of like, they covered up a murder. They had, by all accounts, there's other, like there's, there's rumors of, of uh, Vince McMahon covering up a, a murder uh, and paying, paying off people for um, uh, Jimmy Snuka. So it's, it's not like, you know, as we've talked about all these professional, like big professional league sports, these are huge businesses with a, a lot of money. And when you have a lot of money, you have a lot of power and sway, especially like in a third world country like Puerto Rico, where you can seemingly bribe officers and bribe prosecution and somehow get witnesses to not show up. Um, now it's, you know, when you look at this, I, I still think, I still think he was murdered. Uh to get out of that money i think absolutely i think the angle you know there's a there's tons of documentaries on youtube about this case um there's a dark side of the ring but one of them that you really have to kind of loosely kind of follow these narratives of people talking and and that's why i think i think that gorilla monsoon had given basically the debt owed to him over to bruiser brody to be basically be like a collect he's collect and who better to send six eight maniac yeah Right, and he's right, like, fucking hey, listen, rights. Pay me ten grand. You can you can keep the forty in my shares. I just it's want like this guy's already scared of me. I right. already beat the shit out of him a couple times. I belittle and, him all the time. What a fuck you to the organization down there, right? So then, and then that unfortunately basically makes them want to murder Brody. Like it, it was the perfect storm of events that happened. That amongst a few other things, <laughs> but that I think that was the main thing. And it's just so sad because think about it. Like this guy, like we were we were deprived. Of such an in-ring talent. Think about the fucking, you know, he would have moved on. You know Vince Jr. would have fucking signed him, brought him back to the WWF, right? Like, imagine 
the talent that we would have been able to grow up with and see. Imagine him and Hogan in the ring together. Like, awesome. Yeah. Right? Two big men just fucking beat. Like, I don't know. I think he'd do circles around Hogan personally, athletically anyways. Well, yeah. I mean, Hogan was um, – Hogan was – let's let's be real. He he was a limited moveset, moveset limited in-ring skills, but personality to 100. Yeah, personality right. and looks. Right, and I think Bruiser Brody was a full package back then, and it's it's Absolutely. it's it's terribly sad that you know we lost a talent like that way before his time, and it's an an absolute atrocity um, that there was never justice for him. His family never got justice. He had a young son at the time, never got justice. His wife, like it, it's fucking heartbreaking. And, man. And not, Imagine your family member being murdered in a foreign country, well, and you not getting any information for how long. Yeah, exactly. And then well, and then the thing is and then the people who you know did it going on to or no did it or, and let's be honest, like Carlos is 100% in accomplishing this. I have no doubt. Accomplice. In my mind. Accomplice. Yeah. And, and you're going to see him be, you know become a Hall of Fame wrestler, right? And these these guys are used by promotions. No one ever turned a blind eye to these guys. No one ever blackballed them. Wow, you know what though? Like, someone. and the in the hard part about that too is, is unfortunately, Bruiser Brody didn't make a ton of friends. Yeah, right. He didn't. He he fucked over a lot of people by doing things for himself, which you know he had to. Good for him for doing that. You don't you don't make fourteen grand a fucking week in 1985 unless you're a smart businessman and you're taking care of yourself yeah. first and foremost, right? And unfortunately, in doing that, he burnt a lot of bridges. And there was a lot of bad blood. So there was probably a few people that was like, well, maybe he got what he was coming to him. Yeah. And so he, Bruiser Brody, we touched on, he, he unfortunately died in hospital July 17th, 1988 at 42 years old um, from stab wounds. He had a, a nick in his artery. He was stabbed in the heart, uh, basically two, two eight inch wounds in the abdomen and uh, a slash on the back. That's a big, that's a big knife. Right. And uh, it's a big blade. Again, like I said, it's a witness saw it and nothing was ever done. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Carlos or Jose Gonzalez even spent a day in in jail. He he, they, somebody posted bail for him right away. Yeah, I wonder who that was. Yeah, right. Uh, but it's the whole thing stinks. It's terrible. It's a it's a black eye on wrestling. <laughs> One of many. One of many. Yeah, and it's um. It's crazy that uh, just no nothing was ever done. It's a shame. Um, all we can do now is just enjoy, you know, if you didn't know, if you're a wrestling fan, you watch wrestling, you enjoy wrestling, go watch some Bruiser Brody matches. Uh, yeah, I, I have some actually. Like I, So when, when we went and wrote, when we decided to do this case file, I wanted to figure out who he was, right? So I got a few essential matches if you guys are interested in it. Um AJPW, what is that? And it's Japan, Japanese wrestling. I don't know what it stands for though. Um, one of his matches with Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, he's got a really good one with. He's teaming up with uh, Jimmy Snuka against Terry Funk and Dory Funk. Um, he's got obviously a bunch with Anoki, um, but I would definitely look up him versus Superfly Snuka. He's got like a couple really really fun matches. Um, and then he's got one in the CSW versus Ric Flair. And then, of course, the infamous uh, CF uh, or CWF match versus Lex Luth uh, Luger, which was the cage match. Yeah. Those were kind of my favorite. But even just if you got it, if you uh, if you got a time, even look up his promos like back when he was King Kong Brody. Look up a few of his promos, like just fucking gold. Uh, he cuts a really, really good pro uh, promo against Dusty Rhodes which is Dusty Rhodes is infamous Pro for being one of the best promo guys of all time. Yeah, and, and Brody gives it right back to him. Like it's, it's super like, he, yeah, man, it just the talent that we it's sad that we lost. Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate. Um, I, I don't know. There's nothing being done now, but like I said, rest in peace to uh, Bruiser Brody. Uh, absolute legend gone way too early. It's kind of a sad end to a sports conspiracy, but the Absolutely. conspiracy is like the, the you know I'll say right now like Jose Gonzalez with the backing of WWC and Carlos 
Calrone. Calone. Calone. Yeah. Yeah. C O L O N. Yeah. Uh, Carone. Uh, he said Carone a few times. Yeah, whatever. I don't <laughs> Maybe care. that's Fuck I don't that know. Guy. Uh, you know, I have no doubt in my mind that they had they paid, they greased some palms to obstruct justice. Sad. Right, and get Jose Gonzalez off because Jose Gonzalez was. I think they. I think while Jose Gonzalez most likely volunteered to do it, um, I bet the plan was made up by other people. Oh, well, absolutely. WWC. He's small fish in yeah. this fucking situation, but right. And he was he was he was a guy that he was like, yeah, I'll do it as long as you got my back, and we're you know, like we're gonna do this. But like I said, I think Tony Atlas and and uh, Zeb Coulter threw a wrench in it. The original plan, and I think that's why you see that. I think you see the original plan in there of like, yeah, a fan did it, and you're yeah. like, well, how did that make any sense? But it makes sense if he, Jose Gonzalez was going to pick him up and kill him, right before he got there, because why else was Jose Gonzalez going to pick him up from that hospital? Absolutely, right? or from the hotel. Yeah, right, to get well, because because they or you know, Bruiser was like, we need to talk about my money. Gonzalez was like, absolutely, I'll come pick you up. Yeah, let's sort it out. Yeah, and they, he was going to kill him. He was going to kill Absolutely. him before. Uh, and like I said, his plan was kind of – the original plan was had a wrench thrown in it. Absolutely. Um, anyways, that's Sports Conspirators uh, for this week. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, SportsConPod, Instagram, Sports Conspirators, or TikTok, at Sports Conspirators. Uh, shoot us a message. Let us know what you think. Was he murdered? Um, was it a cover-up? Let us know. Let us know what you want to cover. Uh, what us – what you – we want to cover on sports conspirators. We want to hear from you guys. Uh, anything else, Andrew? Nothing. All right, Zell, ring those bells. Sports conspirators. Oh, peace. Thanks for listening to Sports Conspirators. Brought to you by Big Theory Productions. For more shows by Big Theory Productions, search Big Theory Productions anywhere you get podcasts. Audio production, mixing, and publishing by Meteor Sound Studio. Meteor-Recording.com.